Joining us on the line now is American actor Lou Temple, known as Axel in AMC's The Walking Dead, as well as starring in Domino, Waitress and Unstoppable. Firstly, Lou, how are you? I'm well, Henry. Thank you so much for having me. It's always good to visit with our brothers and sisters across the pond. Uh, we are always delighted to get an opportunity to exchange, uh, cultural exchange. It all starts in the UK, does it not? We appreciate y'all and invite you over to work with us quite often. <laughs> Whether you want to or not. Lou, thank you very much for joining us today. I think we'll talk about uh, quite a few things. I want to touch on, obviously, The Walking Dead. You played Axel in that. And also baseball, uh, future projects. And, of course, I wanted to touch on your battle with leukemia as well as an actor, how that kind of affected you. Yeah. I think we'll start on The Walking Dead, if that's okay. Were you a fan of the show then before you went for the part? Moderately, Henry. Certainly not to the effect that some people were or have become. It was a graphic novel that was placed across my desk based on some of my horror background through many of the Rob Zombie films, Devil's Rejects, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween. And this came across my desk, The Walking Dead. I thought it was done incredibly well, and it was very graphic. And my immediate reaction was this could never find its way into our viewing population. Or if they did it, it would be so watered down, it, it wouldn't have the same impact. And I totally missed on that. So at some point, I was invited to read for the pilot episode of The Walking Dead. They had invited me in to read for a character by the name of Merle. Oh, right. And I read for Merle, quite lascivious and vicious and racist, and, and thankfully Michael Rooker gave a better representation of Merle. And then shortly after, I was invited back to read for a yet-to-be-unnamed character that was Merle's brother. He wasn't known as Daryl at that point. In fact, he didn't even have a scripted dialogue. So they gave me the same scene with Merle, but just read it different. So thankfully, Norman Reedus was able to land that role for all of us. As my grandfather used to say, there's a chair for every bottom, and mine was the role of Axel. By the time Axel came around, I think the creators thought I was a good fit for Axel and asked me if I would be interested in that role, and I was, obviously. Mm. But at that time, Henry, I was working on a film called The Lone Ranger with Johnny Depp, but at that time, I still had some work to finish up on that film, and I had this huge mustache, you see, a tash, as you call them. <laughs> I was sure that The Walking Dead didn't want their character to have this very specific, rather bygone time looking facial hair. And so I said, look, I would love to do this role and I'd love to join you season three, but I can't shave. And so I'm quite sure that's going to be a problem. So perhaps you can move on and maybe something else. And they're like, no, 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 no. Well, actually, I really wanted this role, but I was trying to play hard to get. <laughs> I declined the role on a couple of conversations with The Walking Dead. And then finally, we all agreed that it was okay. And the rest is history. I think Axel's mustache was as popular as Axel. But at that point, season three, in this new environs of the prison, Henry, and that the team had been at Herschel's farm for an entire season, we hadn't seen a lot of new people other than walkers. And so when we arrived, it was a whole breath of fresh air, so to speak. We were really received well. And then shortly thereafter, we introduced Woodbury and the governor. And yeah. I always felt like after that, the world of The Walking Dead just expanded and it's blown up into something that's enormous right now. And it's so different than when we were on the show because there's so many storylines. Negan takes up his, Dwight's got his, Simon has his, yeah. Jadis has hers, and the King has his, and Jerry's even got a sideline. But I think The Walking Dead is entirely interesting. At the time, we were going through a little economic crisis. It was such a difficult time for most people that it felt like surviving. I felt like The Walking Dead was a metaphor for getting up, like most of us do, to figure out how to survive. Yeah. And walkers were just obstacles like our mortgages or debt or higher education or health insurance, all these things that we have to navigate just to get through our days. I think it's absolutely poignant and, and rather magical and serendipitous, I suppose, to use fancy words. <laughs> 
I think that's very interesting what you say because your analogy of it kind of after the context of the um, financial crash in America and uh, the walkers not really being that important in the sense that they're walkers the politics is what's more important in the show and they are merely obstacles that come and kind of cause tension between the characters I want to I want to talk about Axel in a little bit like you said he was kind of at a point in the show where Woodbury hadn't really come in by this point and so there weren't many survivors now on the show you've got of course well people from the hilltop you've got from the saviors and there's so many more characters whereas you came in at a time where there were very few living people on the show but before we delve into Axel I just want to ask do you do you still watch it and also there's a lot of criticism I'm sure you've probably seen from people saying that oh the walking dead has dipped off or the walking dead is no longer as gripping various people have pointed out audience figures and things are you still as kind of hooked on the walking dead and do you get where a lot of the criticism has come from do you think it's unfair I do still watch The Walking Dead. I actually am an audience member now. I mean, I'll always be a cast member and I'll always be part of that family, and that's very special in and of itself. But it is also a very special place to be an audience member. We don't refer to uh, the audience as as fans. We refer to them as the audience because they participate in the show. I have a little inside interest based on the fact that I know so many of the people on the show, but I'm entirely interested And I recognize how the show has evolved. The show is getting faster, and the storylines are moving faster, even though it feels like it's slowed down. You know, I mean, you want to tell the whole story in one season, that's not what Robert Kirkman and The Walking Dead is about, nor is life. There's so many new storylines, they all have to be attended to, and they all will be. And so I do think that they're doing a good job. It always turns to one amazing episode, which, mark my words, it is coming, and all of this will be long lost. The numbers, I don't know how you keep your numbers, Henry, because there's so much. There's so many choices. Not sure that's an answer to your question, but it's my best answer. No, it definitely is. Um, you spoke then quite fondly, actually, of being part of the Walking Dead family. You said in previous interviews kind of how much you enjoyed mm-hmm. working on the set. I mean, can you kind of, it's, I know you get asked a lot, what is it like to work on, but can you kind of describe, is it is it different to a lot of projects you've done in terms of the family? I know you do things like a kind of a death meal when a character's killed off, they normally go yeah. for a cast meal. And also, who in particular, I know there's people like Andy Lincoln, are, are big names on the Walking Dead, but was there anyone, any other actors that you particularly liked working with that perhaps don't always get the headlines in The Walking Dead? First of all, when you say family, in the entertainment world, it is well beyond anything that I had experienced. And I had worked a lot prior to coming into The Walking Dead, so it wasn't as if I didn't have a lot of experience. Based on the fact, I think, this is all an opinion, this is built in Atlanta, Georgia, which at that time, when it flew under the radar, so out of the tendrils of Hollywood, So there's no hierarchy. There's no, well, there's Andrew Lincoln, he's number one, and there's so-and-so, and and none of that. Everybody eats together. That goes for the background artists to the cast members, wardrobe. Everybody is pulling on that same side of the rope. That is so unique, and nobody's trying to be the one that's getting all the credit. You feel very validated with your craft, no matter what that is. And I think that, in and of itself, is exactly why the show is so successful. And that is very different than any other show. They care so much about every scene, every moment, every second. There's so much pride. And then as you leave, you pass the baton to someone else. So you have these death dinners. It's always difficult to be killed off The Walking Dead because you love this job and you love the people that you work with. But it's also difficult for the team. It's like a great team losing one of their great athletes. So all of a sudden, Andrew Lincoln is like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this without Carl? They are really struggling and grieving the loss of a fantastic character and a good friend. The characters, I mean, they're all so good. I used to enjoy my time with Norman Reedus. We had had a background before I came to The Walking Dead. We'd known each other. Um, he, he's become quite popular. It's not as easy to go have a, a dinner or a cup of with him as it used to be, <laughs> or a pint. Uh, he's a bit of a cult so now, visible. isn't he? He is. He's got a following. The unknowns that you don't hear a lot about, Melissa McBride, who plays Carol, she's a very maternal figure on the team. You know, she's badass in the show, for sure. When I was there, Scott Wilson sort of represented... 
who plays Herschel, the, doesn't he? Yeah, he played Herschel, and he was sort of the voice of experience. He'd been the original Great Gatsby, played George Wilson. He, yeah. he shot Robert Redford. I mean, my God, you know, so... It was great listening to stories that Scott would offer and then watch him turn around and engage in a scene as if he was doing The Great Gatsby. I think interesting people bring interesting ingredients. Chad Coleman brought in a really cool vibe, I thought, to The Walking Dead, playing Tyrese. He brought in a very visceral, confused, what kind of world are we in here? You know, really interesting presentation of Tyrese. Those people were great. For me, Vincent Ward was just a delight, and I thought we had a really lovely chemistry. It was the best of times. I'll tell you, Henry, it was great. You mentioned Vincent Ward then, who, of course, plays Oscar. I want to ask yeah. about Axel and Oscar now, because, of course, the prisoners had a bit of a ropey start on The Walking Dead. They were frozen out by Rick, who didn't really want them to be part of the group. Everyone was very annoyed when Axel and Oscar died. You've probably seen online and in articles and everything. Mm-hmm. People weren't happy. I'm sure we'll touch on that in a little bit. But on Axel's death, I, I hear that you kind of, not protested, but you had a few words, because obviously you were desperate to try and keep Axel on for a little bit longer. Sure. So for me, Glenn Mazzara had called, and we had just seen each other the week before, and he was just talking about how Axel's great, and we've got these ideas, and there's some hidden secrets with Axel, and these storylines that we'll be able to address, and then all of a sudden I get a call, looks like we got to take you out. And at that time, he wasn't quite sure. What had happened was they knew the governor had to land death because otherwise he'd be impotent. But they weren't sure it was going to be Axel. And they had talked about actually at that time, series regulars, please don't say anything to anyone, I was told. And then he called back and he said, yeah, I think you drew the short straw. And you do this what I call the denial dance. You kind of try to come up with some alternative (laughs) idea, storyline. You know, how about taking Alan out? That guy's a jerk. No, Alan, he's not quite as popular as if you go out. I don't think he'll have the impact. And then all of a sudden, Henry, you have to accept it, and you want to honor your character and do a darn good job. And they had invited me to sort of come into the writer's room to figure out how to do this. I said, no, no, they're great. The writers know what they're doing. Just let's try to make it shocking. The only thing I offered was, I remember in the Zapruder tapes of the Kennedy assassination, how utterly shocking that was. It was a great gut punch. We didn't see it coming. And I worked as much as I could on the day to not indicate that it was coming. And that was all that lighthearted banter about, I got this crazy brother that started a little story, and then all of a sudden, bang. And it couldn't have gone probably any better. Getting back to Oscar... He's in the makeup chair, sees a script floating around, picks it up and reads it prior to it being released. Oh, no. And sees the last page, Oscar dies. He's like, what? You know, so that was a mistake. And I think they've taken great pains to make sure that's never happened. Again, when the word came out, finally, that I was going to be leaving, Andrew Lincoln was the guy who was very disappointed because he really enjoyed the character. So he actually went to the producer to say, I think we may be making a mistake, can we reconsider? And so I'll always appreciate that. And people are coming to you so sad, several of them were on the chopping block. (laughs) (laughs) The greatest thing about the death dinner is that it's quite a nice, posh dinner, and the check just passes you right by. You don't get engaged in in having to foot the bill. But uh, I hope you bought the most expensive uh, thing on the uh, menu. I did. I think I bought two of them. One to eat that night, one to take home. (laughs) Last thing on Axel. You say that, obviously, I imagine you go to a lot of Comic-Cons and get recognised. I know some actors, not with The Walking Dead necessarily, but with big series like that, often get a bit annoyed when they're known for being one character. When people come up to you in the street and kind of say, oh, you know, you were Axel with The Walking Dead, does it ever get annoying or is it privileged? Yeah, I don't ever take it as a bother or being annoyed. I take it as validation for A, the show, and B, the work that I did was appreciated. So I appreciate the idea that somebody still thinks about Axel. I don't get bothered in the least. I think someone who might get bothered is someone maybe is trying to do something else and not getting the chance to do that something else because, you know, they're just so stuck. Moving on from The Walking Dead now, Lou, uh, just a couple more things I wanted to ask you. Firstly, baseball. I hear that you uh, were obviously very into baseball before you got into acting. Were you ever close to having a career in there? I know you worked at one point for the New York Mets. Did you ever want to stay with baseball? 
Yes. So my baseball life is sort of my passions ever since I was a little boy growing up. played. I actually didn't even know actors were real. But that being said, loved baseball, played baseball, got a college scholarship, got drafted to play professional baseball with Seattle Mariners, and then played to the level that my skills would take me, and then became a person that was working in baseball as someone that was out coaching and or scouting, looking for players around not just our country, but in the Dominican Republic and Venezuela. You know, people would give their left arm for that job. And yet there was something that, quite frankly, in Houston, Texas, I, I followed a girl into an acting class, as one does, to maybe chat her up for a date and I looked down on the stage and saw what these folks were doing, and it just spoke to me. There's my people. That's where I belong. And um, I started pursuing it and was able to kind of do that on the side. And then at some point, Bob Watson, who at that time was a general manager of the Houston Astros, he said, look, you have this desire in you, I can tell. And you have this other desire in you that you're fulfilling in the baseball world. It's a lifetime vocation. It's never going to let you go. And you're really getting dug in. And if you don't pursue this now, you never will. He kind of kicked me out the window and I had a choice to make. I could have gotten right back into baseball with another team. But his words echoed in my head, and I decided to pursue acting. And I went to Brooklyn College and trained until I worked at the Alley Theater with a company called the Moving Theater Company that had come into the Alley Theater made up of Vanessa Corrin and Lynn Redgrave. They were doing the Shakespeare, and, right. and they hired me, and I got a real education. David Harewood was in that company at the oh, time. Wow. David, a uh, very fantastic actor, obviously. And everything he's done in the UK, and he's doing really well over here now, too. And uh, I love this saying that I actually learned from Michael Cutlett playing Abraham. He says, you know, we all are just how we're drawn. And, and that's kind of a great statement, and yeah. I, I really appreciate it. Just lastly on baseball, very quickly, do you, so you said you kind of took it as far as you could playing with your skill set. Do you have any regrets yeah. at all? Nothing about baseball. Maybe that I couldn't figure out how to get over that hump. At the time that I was playing, I don't think we were as advanced in our in our training physically. I don't think we were developing our physical capacity as much as we could have. So I could have gotten stronger in today's world, um, performance-enhancing opportunities through some chemicals that I chose not to do. Would I have been a better player with those? I don't know. In hindsight, I look at myself, Henry, and I think I was as good as I was going to get. No regrets. Yeah. I got so much out of it, and I still have so much out of it. I dreamt as a 10-year-old boy about playing in the big leagues, and today I still have that dream. When I'm really well-rested and really at peace, I dream that I play in the big leagues just like I did as a 10-year-old boy. And not many of us can say, oh, I can go to sleep and have the same dream I had as a boy. But what I love about sports, Henry, it's a perfect drama. There's no script. Mm. On page 97, you don't know how it's going to end because you just don't know. And so I really adore the drama of athletics. I am a huge baseball fan, and I'm hoping for baseball to catch on just a little bit over in the U.K. because... You have fantastic athletes, and I, it's a thinking man's game, and I think that serves the Brits entirely. So well, the NFL maybe, is becoming fairly popular over here, so you never know. I know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Moving on now to something away from baseball, Lou, and it's a very sensitive topic I appreciate, um, something that a lot of people might not know about you, but I think it was in 2002 that you obviously had to stop your involvement in an acting project because of a serious illness that you diagnosed with. Out of interest, has that changed your outlook on acting, but also in life generally? No, oh, I think the perspective that you gave from actually being in a, a life-threatening or a place where there are no givens. I mean, you really take on a perspective of how dear day-to-day -day life is. So it was actually 2000, I was diagnosed with leukemia, hmm. and I was on the job in Houston, Texas. I was very sick and lethargic, and I didn't look well on camera, and I, I just wasn't myself, and the producers recognized that, and they didn't feel like it was working, so they, they actually fired me. 
I think it's the only time, fairly certain it's the only time I've been fired from a job. I was living in Los Angeles at the time, but staying with a friend in Houston, he said, buddy, you're not well, you're yellow, you're jaundice, you got to go to the doctor. And I, I went kicking, screaming, swearing, okay, I'm not spending the night, though. Well, I didn't spend the night, but I... I spent several nights. I was eight months at MD Anderson with hairy cell leukemia, which is a rare form, but fortunately for me, very treatable. And I learned a lot about myself and about people during that time. I was laying in a hospital bed attached to tubes and monitors and recognized that my yesterdays didn't really account for anything. Tomorrows weren't given. I didn't know if I was going to be there tomorrow. I was so sick. And the only thing that mattered was there in that moment. And I, I came to understand what the presence really represents. And it really is the only thing that you have this, this moment is that we're talking. I've understood that time can be very short. And if there's something that should be done or you need to do or you want to do or you'd like to do and you put it off, you should maybe attend to it. Time is not promised. The other thing it did for me, just in all honesty, was it having made it through that bout of illness with so much medication and so much concern by all those that were my caretakers, uh, it reaffirmed my faith. It gave me a perspective that there's a lot of good in the world and there's a lot more for everybody than we tend to believe. Now, all that being said, that sounds very pious, and, and, and of course it is, because there are times I'm in traffic in Los Angeles on the 405, really frustrated, <laughs> and I swore I'd never get frustrated again because I had made it, I had lived, I had been given a second chance on life. But that being said, I am only human, so there are times where I will be like anyone, very frustrated, but I also have to catch myself and be aware wow, you've been given this amazing opportunity to try this again and be better. And so that was, that was amazing. That was an amazing experience. There was so much heartbreak in those moments that, well, he's not going to make it. My parents are saying goodbye to me. Oh, he looks like he made it through the night. Maybe he'll make it through the day. It became this incredible adventure that I recognized I was part of, and, and it, was, it was amazing. There was, there was so much sadness and yet so much humor. I think at some point my, my mind was the only thing functioning, and it was like, oh, great, I don't have to drag this carcass around anymore, and I was, <laughs> had crazy, brilliant thoughts. It was a delight to, in some degree, and then in hell in another, the ultimate horror film. Yeah. And as cancer goes, I also recognize it as it is not a four-letter word. I think it is a six-letter word, and, 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 it, and it's doable. We can win, and we're just even better. That's evolved, too. We're better at beating cancer than we were. Anybody out there that's uh, experiencing or being diagnosed, you know, you get a little time, get a little time to be bothered and concerned, and then it's, it's time like Andrew Lincoln to roll up your sleeves and, and go fight. Did Don't you doubt. consider giving up acting out of interest, Lee? At that point in time, I think I did. At that point in time, it didn't seem very important to me. Um, my first job back, a gentleman hired me, and, and I felt like I was not very good because I hadn't, you know, hadn't been working. It was a gentleman named Thomas Hayden Church, and he was directing a movie, and he saw me. And I think he had known me before, and he couldn't believe it was the same guy of the hell that I'd been through. And here I was at this audition, and I think he just said, this guy is bringing a lot of life to this character, and I'm going to do this. And, you know, I probably wouldn't have pursued it much more had I not gotten an opportunity to go back to work. You know, I just, I just got healthier. Jeez, I was, I was skin and bones at that point in time. Yeah. I didn't look particularly good on camera. And so I feel like... Acting wasn't something that I wanted to get back into. It just, nothing really seemed important, just living. And then I realized, oh, geez, I got to do something to take care of myself. So I did come back to Los Angeles and, and give it a go. And then, you know, things started picking up and things started to, to happen. And I recognized, well, this new outlook is helping me. This outlook of gratitude is serving me pretty well, so let's see where it takes me, and, and here we are.
Yeah. Well, Lou, thank you very much for sharing a lot of that. A very personal one. I, I appreciate you asking because I do think it's important and I'm not ashamed. You know, when you get sick, that's the first thing you do. You become ashamed as if you did something wrong. And that's part of the psychology of being sick. Some mm-hmm. people will be in denial, and that's counterproductive for how you're going to get better. The first thing you have to do is admit, I'm, I'm sick. I'm not what I was, and I'm not well, and this is bigger than me. I'm, I need help. And then there were so many philosophical things. I was in a lot of pain. And I had to actually spend time in my mind to reason where the pain was. Most of us are told, don't think about pain. I realized, I learned that, you know, if I think about pain, that it's not going to hurt. If I find where it is in my body, if I give it a color, if I bring my blood flow to it, if I take care of that place in my head and really focus on it, that's when it's going to get better, not denying it. I try to start by honoring it however it goes, even a bullet to the head. I think it's a fantastic example for people who, you know, anyone who suffers with a serious illness, not just with acting, but to come back and to reach the top again like you have. I think you're a fantastic example. Lou, I just I want to ask that. I want to ask a few more things about future projects, if that's okay. You've got quite a few films sure. uh, and on-screen projects coming up. Limbo, Texas Cotton, The Iron Orchard, Cut Off. What of these are you kind of most excited? I know there's a few more as well. What are you most excited for fans of, your, of yours to see? Well, they're like children, so they're all really important, and I feel I would be negligent if I picked one over the other. But I would say this. I did a project this January, this winter, called Come Said the Night. It's a psychological thriller slash horror. It's elements of the Babadook meets uh, Captain Fantastic meets Pan's Labyrinth. It's a fairy tale that's real. It's quite disturbing about a father and his his children trying to conceal them from the influence of the outside world and also trying to repress his sexual urges while his 13-year-old daughter is coming of age and where that conflict meets. All weave together through the construct of Greek mythology. He's polyphonetic, so he's trying to teach the belief in the Greek god system into his family. And so it's really in-depth and dug in and character-driven, so I'm really excited about that. And when does that come Um, out again, Lou? I think they've just locked picture. We've shot that, and let's call that this fall. I have a movie coming out this month, or actually April, that I think is going to take the cinema by storm. It's called The Endless. The Endless. And it is a sci-fi hybrid, very Lovecraftian. It's about the occult and time loops, and this cult in San Diego, the Heaven's Gate group that off themselves based on that Haley Bob Comet, um, they never left. They just are experiencing this loop, and they return every 10 years in this commune that is utopian called Arcadia, and they return younger, or they never age. And so I play this 108-year-old environmentalist uh, John Muir, who was Scottish, by the way, and he uh, <laughs> he understood um, all the trails in the United States, and he set up the parks and recreation system in the U.S. here. A big bearded fellow. And so this movie has just received incredible effusive applause in all the festivals that it's been in starting Tribeca a year ago. I think it's going to do very, very well. And then recently, we just finished this Really interesting little uh, heady psychological turn called Limbo. Limbo is the judgment of your soul in purgatory between heaven and hell. And it's a little bit of a courtroom drama to some degree where my character hasn't led an exemplary life. And the good Lord has sent down a very young and inexperienced attorney to represent me, and she's up against an old, bitter soul representing old Scratch, old Satan down there. And we go back and see my life, see all the bad turns that my character has done. So I'm actually really excited about that as well. Mm. So there's three off the cuff that I'm super jazzed about. And there's a television show that I play the mayor of Houston, Texas, where I'm trying to gentrify a lower-income housing development called The Fifth Ward. That's the name of the television show. It's on the Urban Movie Channel. 
I've sort of found myself in the independent film world, which I don't mind. I love being on something as public as The Walking Dead. I love being on something as, as large as that. But I don't mind kind of finding these independent features that maybe we'll land one of these just right and, you know, get that little indie that, that everybody adores somehow. Still out there doing it. You don't seem to stop. Thank you're in, you. You're in everything. Um, just a couple, well, last thing I wanted to ask you, Lou, because I think we've chatted for a while, but I could chat to you all day, I think. We've had a really interesting conversation. Lastly, I want to ask you, oh, we're, thanks. of course, based here in Warwick, which isn't too far from Stratford. Now, you've got quite a large involvement with the UK. You, you spent a lot of time in Stratford, I think, because of your wife. Um, yeah, just tell, yeah. Us, tell us about the UK. Tell us about Stratford. What do you think? Well, my missus is a Brit. She's from Stratford-upon-Avon, and her, her mom lives there now. So, so we go back. She, too, is a cancer survivor as well, a oh, leukemia really? survivor. Yeah, Lisa Temple, formerly Lisa Crook of the UK. She is very proud of being British, so I've become proud to be uh, married to a Brit. <laughs> uh, we venture into the UK as often as we can to go see Mum. We uh, Lisa flat over in Stratford, hire a car. As you say, I like to drive, but my wife doesn't think so, because occasionally on the roundabout, I'll cause a little uh, disturbance by maybe looking the wrong way or going the wrong way. But uh, <laughs> I, I like the challenge. Ven- venture over into Harrow, East Harrow, actually, up where the boys' school is. Her brother lives in that area. We have dear, dear friends in Chiswick, where we stay, one of my favorite places in London. And then we'll jump over to Cambridge to see her other sister. So we get to see a lot of the country. Of course, the Midlands are entirely different than the other areas, and I've come to understand that. And through my ventures with The Walking Dead to go meet the audience, so to speak, um, I may venture into a place like... uh, Stoke on Trent, Trent on Stoke. Which one is it? It's, it's Stoke on Trent. I think. <laughs> Thank you, Stoke on Trent. That's what I thought. Yeah, right, exactly. Stoke on Trent, or Nottingham, or even lo and behold, not sure uh, anyone accepts Milton Keynes, Keynes as a city in London, but it actually, or in the UK, it actually is. It's about as different a city or town as any, I think, that I've been to in the U.K., for the U.K., just sort of rather false modern, you know, and it's, it's just bizarre. But I get there, and then, of course, Birmingham, and I enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, you know, Stratford-upon-Avon is such the, it's the quintessential, lovely, quaint village. It's very uh, nice, isn't it? Shakespeare. Oh, it's delightful, and there's so much tourism, and they do that. I enjoy particularly Christmas time. Uh, because I think the U.K. does Christmas exceptional. They play through all the way through the holiday season into January 6th, there were, thereabouts. You know, we're quite often by the 26th, the day after Christmas, we're ready to wrap it up, tie a bow on it, and say goodbye. So I love the holiday season in the U.K., the Dickens Christmas, all the pageantry and i think it's lovely i like a uh, i like a good fry up in the morning uh, <laughs> i'm good for a pint in the afternoon we're happy uh, to adopt you i think you should be uh, british now lou we'll class you as british uh, we're, we're going to adopt you i'll have a thing i'll have a cuppa i'm not opposed <laughs> to having a cuppa funny because my daughter you know she adapts my wife's terminology so she'll put things in the boot uh <laughs> she throws things in the bin uh, she looks for her Bradley occasionally if it rains. You know, she hoovers and she uh, wonders if any post came for her today. So you've got uh, it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think we have a healthy appreciation. We're so different. I'm Southern, as you know, and from Louisiana, and so that's just it's such different cultures, but somehow it's a perfect, delightful mix. I think it's a really special culture in the UK, and I think we all think that. And you go through your trials and tribulations just as much as everyone else, and just weather in and of itself, day to day. Oh God, yeah, nightmare. What, what, whatever that comes to, you know, and then somewhere, the sun peeks out and everyone's off to the park. So I, I can understand. It's fantastic. Well, Lou, thank you very much for joining us. I've really enjoyed that chat. We really appreciate it. Lou Temple there on the line, actor in AMC's The Walking Dead, famous actor. Lou, thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Henry, and I appreciate you and all that you do and and your listeners, and I hope everyone 
has a, a great day. And remember, no man or woman can walk out on their own story. So go tell your story. World's listening. Hey, y'all, this is Lou Temple. You know me as Axel from The Walking Dead. And you're listening to Raw. You follow me? <laughs>